a pleasure to be here. And I'd like to thank the organizers because I'm happy. Um, so I'm going to talk about calligraphs. And some of you may know these objects. They're known by different names. Uh, Horo functions is some, is an, or Horo boundary is another name that's used. But I would like to try to get used to it's. It's also something for me to use the term metric functional. Uh, you can look online. He has a few papers uh, which explain why this is maybe the correct term to use. But that's semantics, so I'm not going to dwell on that so much. Um, it's it's a developing theory kind of do do in functional analysis with uh, linear functionals. And when you don't have a linear structure, things become more complicated. And uh, hopefully there are some things to come. What I'm gonna talk about is some short steps um, uh, that have to do with understanding geometry and its relation to uh, group. All groups, be fine and uh, um, infinite. Okay, so whenever I say group, I mean a finally generated infinite group and not something else. And um, <clears throat> graph. Uh, so hopefully, all of you know what a Cayley graph is. If you don't know some notion, I'm not a group theorist. So if you don't know some notion that I'm talking about, please stop me. But somehow, I expect the audience to know more about groups than I do. Um, so, uh, that we chose the book ninety nine ACM and a group that's small whatever that means I'm going to say in a second then I'm giving here to write what small is then we had really Of course, it's not true because we didn't define what small means, and there are definitely groups with small growth that are not small growth. Um, so you have to first say what small means. So the growth of a group is a group invariant. It, uh, um, it's in quasi-isometries, uh, so specifically not have to with a specific Cayley graph chosen. Sir, uh, open probable group finitely generated again remember when I say group finitely generated and infinite so if you take solvable group then it's either going to be a polynomial growth or in fact it's either going to be in nilpotent which is also known by uh, uh, or it's going to be an exponential growth there are no intermediate growth groups in the family of solvable groups now uh, Milner S in that same year uh, I think it was in American Math Monthly um, do there exist groups of intermediate growth? And this took a while, was answered in the 80s by Gregor Chukusa. He, he uh, uh, gave the, an example of the first intermediate growth group. And not to give you the impression that that was easy, it was not, it took a while, and it even took a much longer time. So all the way up to very, very recently, Chani and uh, Anna Erstler finally pinned down the actual growth rate of the Gregor Chu group. I'm um, not going to speak about that, but um, uh, but uh, then this slide we're going to in, in the following ICM basically to, to conjecture this conjecture. Uh, basically conjecture that his group is the smallest outside the world of polynomial growth groups. Now I've only discussed it with him once. Um, so I don't know the basis for this conjecture other than the fact that nobody has ever found any groups with smaller growth. I think there is actually a better the base system, but it's true for the no person groups. That what? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So there have been, it's true in fact, for there are lots of families of groups. Uh, so pre groups and stuff where people have proved, Lubotsky and others have proved 
uh, the gap conjecture. So, but, uh, uh, but like, uh, um, well, yeah, sorry. It, in in full generality, it, like, it, you know, you could say it started from, so Milner, you could say, you know, ask do there exist intermediate growth groups? Because some of the groups seem to not have any intermediate growth, but um, we know it, my impression is that we're looking at groups through the through intermediate growth through the keyhole, and we don't really see the full group. So I'm not sure, you know, I, I, I'm ambiguous as to what, what small should be put here. But Gregor Chuk has already uh, stated what small should be. So if we follow him, what we put here is the growth function. So what small means is the growth function which grows so the rate, the ball of radius r grows something like three to the r to the alpha for some alpha strictly less than one. So the Gregor Chuk groups grows like this with an alpha strictly greater than half. And Tiani knows the number, I don't. But um, but uh, uh, um, if you uh, plug in some alpha, any alpha less than half, the conjecture is that those should be virtually known. There shouldn't be uh, uh, um, the best known, the best known gap, okay, I'll talk about in a second, is much, much smaller than this. So nothing has been proved anywhere near this uh, function, but you could argue that maybe we want to try, you know, start small and try to prove at least some super polynomial function here uh, 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 and prove that, uh, 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 it, you know, there are no groups, there is a gap, there are no groups between polynomial and some super polynomial function, and uh, any is like that. So what would be um, a strategy to do this? Well, you can go back to Grom. Grom will prove that uh, any group of polynomial groups is actually virtually null, right? So you can, uh, you can so Grom shows you how to take a, um, uh, um, a, a geometric condition and turn it into an algebraic. So we could try to duplicate Grom strategies. What does Grom do? Grom, actually, I want to put this. I'm going to put this here because I want to keep it up. So Grom, a new one. If I'm not mistaken. Um, and we, or let's say, all the real words. Okay, direction uh, um, from uh, right to left is done by Wolf uh, 10 years old for that. Uh, but the other direction is the part. So, this direction started from the geometry, it goes to the algebra is part of it. And um, Gorman's original paper, which I haven't read uh, uh, because it's really, uh, you, you know, you need a solution to a Hilbert stick problem. And, and, and there's a lot of very, very deep mathematics. You need a whole course. Just to like get to the stage where you can read the paper, uh, um, but um, um, but the basic idea is to do two things. One is to find a representation Okay, so you find to start with a group of polynomial growth. You use the polynomial growth to find the representation, and I'm going to replace this step in a second. And then the second step is once you have a representation, okay, you have structure, you have linear matrices. Okay, so by representation, I mean finite dimensional representation. So you have a group of matrices, so you can use that structure to understand things. And I'm gonna say exactly what you wanna understand in this situation. And then when you understand something, then you do some induction on something. And in this case, what Romo done, what everybody following Romo has done since, as far as I know, but you an induction on the degree, degree of polynomial growth. So suppose your group grows like R to the phi, right? Use the uh, uh, linear uh, representation to uh, you use the linear information to go down to another group of uh, uh, the grows like at most like R to the four, and so on and so forth. And then all I have to do is take care of the linear case or maybe the finite case. And you're done. Okay, so um, uh, so 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 that's the structure of Gromov's proof, and this is the the hard part. This is what Gromov use uses ultra limits and and you know and, and lead groups theory to, to do. And later on, people came and did other things for this. But um, one thing is um, uh, uh, so so this is what my impression is that group theorists like 
like it when you say that you find their presentation, it kind of uh, gives them uh, 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 happy, warm feelings. I mean, okay, that's what Martin Fasabo told me once. But, uh, um, but actually, what, what, what the, way, the way I, I saw it as an outsider was that you don't find a representation, but actually what the representation, representation gives you is that um, if you have polynomial growth, then uh, you just you get, the, you get the polynomial growth that implies that the group is virtually indicable. I'll write down a little bit just in case anybody doesn't remember since it's not so... So we virtually indicable or let me just write indicable. So first of all, it just means that there's a finite index subgroup with that property, and indicable exists. Then uh, um, it's rejected. Okay, so you have a subjective homomorphism on the C equivalent to have a uh, a, uh, a non trivial homomorphism into an abelian group, it's the same. Okay, so um, so you use the representation theory to, uh, together with the fact that you have a group of polynomial walls, to get, uh, there are many ways to do this. You can use tits alternative, you can use less sophisticated things uh, uh, to get uh, this uh, uh, subgroup of finite index with a subjective homomorphism onto Z. And that's how you, and then uh, you take the kernel, that kernel is going to have. Degree less of growth, and that's how you do the. the uh, okay. So the hard part is finding this uh, virtual homomorphism, and uh, there there are a few ways that, that this is done. And so Gromov does it by understanding the Lie group, and um, and uh, and then you can say there's a proof by Kleiner. Um, so Kleiner. Uh, so all these all these proofs are now going to do step one. What's written there? Step one, finding the virtual uh, homomorphism. Step two is that everybody just does step two. And so Kleiner uh, uh, did this by uh, uh, showing that the dimension of space of Lipschitz harmonic functions is finite. And then you need some extra arguments to show, to show that that gives you a uh, but that's not so difficult. Uh, um, okay, so um, so uh, this is what I did. He basically took uh, he um, basically took uh, the um, only a mini proof of the house conjecture and um, in, in, the, in, in the situation where you have a polynomial growth. This is polynomial growth, and then you, you really can't get away with anything. Better than that. So, uh, um, another thing that I want to mention is Kleiner is, uh, when is Kleiner? Kleiner is, I think, 2008, if I'm not mistaken, or something like that. Uh, um, I still remember when it came out on the archive. Maybe it came out a little before that. And Kozawa, uh, maybe 2018 or something like that, uh, gave a new proof. Um, uh, um, Kozawa does this. Uh, um, uh, differently, uh, as I shows, uh, you don't even write down uh, um, the exact thing. But if you if you if you kind of distill what Azawa does in his paper, then he's basically he basically proves the following: he very he, he proves either you have this desired virtual homomorphism, or something else happens, which has to do also with harmonic functions, and that something else is impossible in uh, polynomial growth groups. Okay. And in fact, was always, it might be that that's the, the, the way to go. And some thoughts are along that. I'm not going to talk about what he says is impossible in uh, polynomial growth groups. It's in harmonic functions. If you turn that out, there's one place where it's non quantitative, the using the ergodic theorem. You can give a quantitative version of that, uh, 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 um, uh, the ergodic theorem in that specific situation. Then you would be able to prove uh, again. So there's like one level that boils down where you use the following for back there, not scary like what basically right there. So there are some ways to go about that. But these were so I'm signing up, these approaches were had to do with this step one. You want to start with polynomial growth and you want to go to this virtual homomorphism. So first of all, you can weaken the gap conjecture in a few ways. 
One is to weaken the growth function, so you may make it smaller growth function. And another is to just ask for a virtual uh, homomorphism to just show that any small enough group is virtually indifferent. You don't want to show that um, you know, it's actually virtually open, you just want to show that it's virtually equal in the first step. And you could say, well, you know, maybe that's not enough. Because you use polynomial growth again in the second step here. So let me give you um, just one scenario before I go into uh, all the uh, metric functionals. So uh, this is a theorem we have with um, more system on it. Um, it's yet uncomfortable because I'm uh, still thinking of some more ideas that we've got to do with the but the, it's written somewhere. And um, um, uh, so uh, um, you can do, can do step two, so you can find the formal here uh, uh, for growth, which is less than um, exponential log to the power to the beta here on. Beta is less than two, but any beta. Okay, so you can, if you have a group with very small growth, almost log squared, okay, supposed to be one basically log squared, then uh, uh, um, uh, we can do this. Step two. So again, the, the, if I formally say what the result is, if you prove that any group of this growth, such growth, has a uh, is virtually indicable, then I can actually prove that any such group is actually virtually. Okay. Yes, so Shalom Kao, um, um, I should have said that here. So, what Shalom Kao? So uh, um, they uh, quantify basically they quantify Kleiner's theorem. They went through the whole proof. They turned the uh, ten-page proof into an eight-page proof, and they basically quantified really going through the proof. They quantified um, all the steps. So harmonic becomes almost harmonic. Everything becomes you know epsilon delta or something instead of just a notion. And it was fruitful enough to uh, give a lot of things. And one thing was that you can prove. That um, they prove the gap for um, uh, exponential. So this is polynomial, right? Because I'm just writing the constant in these growth functions. Right? So this is just any polynomial. And then what you do is you add a lot of log on. That's the only thing. It's not as explicit, but it, you, need to, you need to go through the eight pages to find out what this one is. And they didn't write down that we were going to specific examples. They claim one of them. Yeah, yeah. So it's a small enough number. I, I, I tell you how went through the computations and, and, and gives some number which is small enough to work, but like yeah, but it but it should be better than that. But, but anyway, so it's a slight improvement on polynomial. This is this is much bigger. Uh, this is another log, almost another log. Uh, again, this is a very small function. So that's the best step that, to my knowledge, I think. If anybody in this room doesn't say otherwise, I think yeah, that's, my uh, uh, that's the best thing. No, um, yeah, so I've been focusing a lot. This is kind of this project came out because Maud asked me, Well, what do you do if you are if your project succeeds? What do you do then? Uh, but I've been focusing a lot on thinking about how, how you do get these virtual homomorphisms. How do you get step one either from polynomial growth or from small growth or to do it in other ways? So that we can maybe do it for a larger group. So one thing that lends itself very nicely to um this so one thing that, that lends itself very nicely to um to finding virtual homomorphisms is the group action. On the space of Lipschitz uh, functions. So let me let me take some definitions. So suppose we look at the space of all functions 
I'm going to look at Richard's face, but I'm going to um, uh, look at this face uh, for reasons we might become clear later. So all integer value functions from your control um, that send uh, the identity element to zero, basically monitored by the constant, and such that um, uh, there are one emissions. So, okay. So you fix some data graph and you look at the most one metric function. And of course, if you change the Kelly graph, you get a different space of functions because you've changed the metric. Um, the group acts on this, the group acts on this space, the G act on L. Um, if you want to act on a function H at input one, then you know about the print settings. But remember, you have to send the origin to zero. So just correct. Okay, so that's, a, that's actually check. And the nice thing about this is that fixed points for the admin are the limits. Okay, so you check that if H is a fixed point, then H is a normal Okay, so this detects homomorphisms. This space detects homomorphisms, and any homomorphism, of course, scales from one Lipschitz function, so uh, it detects them. And another thing is that it also detects virtual homomorphisms because uh, uh, finite levels. Uh, so H has a finite orbit if you find it. Is meaning that there is a finite index subgroup for which the restriction of which that subgroup is. So this also detects the So this is a very nice space uh, uh, to work with. And in fact, this was considered in other contexts, also by Roman. Of course, um, uh, space was considered as a, a space of boundary, as, as a boundary of, of um, K. So um, I can give examples of functions in this space. And I'm trying to look up it. I'm going to look at the problem. One is our identity that is a This function, so for every x in the end, you find the Guzman function, dx. And these functions sit inside this space. So you have a way of embedding your group inside this space L, okay? And so uh, this space L is um, uh, compact, you just take uh, uh, so the home of theory, so there's that point where it's going to be a discrete. So this is a compact space, you embed your group in it, so you can look at the closure of G embedded in this space, and then you can define boundary of G to be just um, the closure of it, Without the G, and we're thinking again of G as embedded via this function. Okay? And the elements of this uh, um, boundary are what numbers called metric functional. So this is the metric functional boundary. And uh, uh, in other contexts, these are called horror functions or the horror boundary. Uh, um, these were used extensively. Uh, Hyperbolic groups. They are looked at very, very, uh, um, maybe not very, but not that much uh, uh, in the context of small groups, groups, things like that. It's, it's not, we're still really in the dark uh, with respect to what happens in these things. They're very, very sensitive. So, one big disadvantage it's very, very sensitive to the actual data, that's the actual metric. You can even sum the general metric to this. But the very method. And uh, for example, if you take if you take um if you just take G squared as the standard L1, right? That's just the, the, the standard uh jewelry set, then the value looks like this. You have four special elements corresponding to plus minus infinity and all plus possibility, then you have. Happens of B, 
sitting in the sun, which corresponds to four different quantities of Z corresponding to the looks like the square of the increase curve. Okay, that's the boundary, right? If you, if you, if you go to the, if you look at L2, okay, so if you look at just uh, the, the inherited measure from, from, uh, from the Euclidean plane, it's not a case of that, but if you look at that, then what you get here is the circle, okay? So you see, you know, things really are changed completely when you change uh, on a phase graph. So it's very hard to understand what's going on, but um, <clears throat> but it does have it does have some advantages. Let me try to look into it, why this is good use to search for um, search for virtual homomorphisms. So. So um, one thing is that um, so if G is small, right? For if G is small, which is which are the groups that we want to speak about, then we know it's me, right? Any sub exponential growth group is meaningful. So uh, um, so G acts on this compact space, okay? Check. And it's immutable, so there is an invariant probability. Okay, in fact, I don't even need to do it with small growth, I could do it in general with a general group because instead of an invariant probability measure, I make a stationary probability measure with respect to random walk. That's already maybe too much probability. So, we're working with small groups in here. So, you have an invariant probability measure, let's call it. Maybe. Right now, if this probability measure, if the new happens, we will have an atom. Okay, so if you have one function that gets probability minutes from the new, then that uh, uh, function must have a finite orbit because it's invariant. So you act on it, all of them have the same probability mass, so you can't have infinitely many of them. So uh, uh, then that atom has a finite orbit. And inside finite orbits, give us a virtual homomorphism. So the enemy is a small group such that every invariant probability measure on the probability is uh, atoms. Okay, you have to understand what goes on. So these things. Are well equipped, and in fact, Anders uh, uh, suggested to use these risks, but you know that. But even in far from the solution here, Anders already suggested to use these boundaries to replace step one in global scale. So Anders already suggested, let's just find, you know, and, and, and use this action, find a fixed point or a finite orbit inside this boundary. And if we could prove that any polynomial group has a finite orbit inside of it, inside its major functional boundary, then uh, uh, we, we have yeah. the polynomials here. And this is kind of, I like this suggestion, I really like this suggestion because it, it doesn't say anything about polynomial growth. It really kind of says, I'm going to take some geometry and I'm going to work with the geometry. So you're looking for a fixed point in the geometric context. So Maybe it has a chance of working for larger. Um, so this is why I'm interested now. Of course, I'm not going to give you any proofs. Yeah, but it's easier to explain the number of three to the So okay, so um, you can check the Mercator graph. This is a very important question, and I'm not going to say more about this during the talk. But you can come to me and tell you later what the idea that happened. But yeah, but it's crucial. A crucial. Observation very, very good is that, um, any and this has to do with the fact that the metric has in the geodesic any graphs of geodesic So, any uh, H is unbounded from the So, not only is it not zero. But it's this is this is very important. People have made mistakes. Probably not today. 
<laughs> make mistakes. Uh, 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 um, because if you want to think about a meaningful proof, you can take the random random model function or random something in the, in the space average in the economic cell, because you can uh, average along, you can take one, you can average along the thermal set, right? And then you take that to infinity, so you get some random, and the expectation of that will be a function which is the uh, more to that. But it will be zero. Yeah. So when you do this in a group of actually is in the is it like the, the only other matches of the uh early comment on the first of all we don't really understand what you're saying. Oh no one thing that's really understand the uh things and and again it depends on the generating set. Um yeah, here the event and then it's like what you're exactly the delta function is that you can get to the same. Okay, and then you're higher dimensional here, you think you just be higher dimensional. And in uh, Heisenberg, or, you know, so there, where my mom will tell you what, what, what happens in Heisenberg. I, I don't know. Um, it, it's, it's, very, it's, it's still very unclear. And, and also, there are different. Uh, they're, they're different. So, uh, I'm almost out of time. So, one thing I should say is, um, uh, is just that these things, again, you, you could say, you could be uh, a skeptic about how, how these things are connected to the growth of young. So, let me just. One of these, I really don't have time to say too much. Um, uh, why, why these things are, are, are really easy or related to the geometry in a, in a, in a very uh, intuitive way? So, so, the fact which needs to be proven is that um, if gamma is a geodesic, again, inside the failure, an infinite geodesic, then like this. The limit as then goes to infinity when you got the So if you're thinking of the elements of gamma as converging inside our space, our big space that was embedded inside the cell, then uh, these converge to some limit exists inside the world. Okay, so all geodesics converge. It is not true that every point in the boundary is a uh, uh, limit of a geodesic. Okay, it's not true. Uh, in media, it is. The standard metric is, but it's not in general. And so these these kinds of points. So here the last time I say so. Uh, I'm gonna go right here. Well, let me know what you're this. It's uh, called a Guzman point. Not to be confused with the Guzman function. Okay, the Guzman point is a point in the in the um uh, um uh, uh, which is the limit of a Okay, and um and in order to leave kind of questions and not leave kind of the race, let me just write one thing down. Hopefully, some of the people. Um, so, um, so the following is the limit. G is virtually C. Okay. Two is that the uh, one boundary of oh, okay. That's right. The boundary of G is finite. Okay. You check just the getting the seven k gap and see it's two points. But it, but um and in fact I should actually add um so this part of the story a month ago, uh where me and Matt proved that um uh, any one dimensional uh, um, any one dimensional uh, graph has a finite uh, uh, um, uh, boundary, and the opposite question we just proved as we have done. Um, so this becomes the improvements in the root case, and um, and we can also add that if uh, is and 
counterpoint is the union. So actually, this is not, this, this is about limits of unity at every point, but that's not even true as soon as we get to the village. I'll say for those of you who are interested in general graphs, now this candy graphs, it's still open. I, I don't have an example. Let me see. Examples. Yeah, for examples where general graphs that don't have linear growth have any growth you want, but they're going to still be one dimension. So, um, uh, so they're still going to have an identity. And that's something that any one dimensional graph has. Um, um, but um, I don't have a, a, an example of a graph who, who has quite a kind even though it has a higher than one dimension. Might be possible. I don't know for general graphs. Um, okay, so uh, um, yeah, I don't have enough time to say something about it. It has to do with how to somehow circumvent problems with dead ends and loops and things like that. I think it's a kind of built fear in the life of TV or natural, natural geometries, but uh, like weird geometries, you get in these intermediate loops. Um, so I'll just remember. 